In his book, The Idea of a University, Colonel John Henry Newman, and it's, I think, appropriate, March Madness, we're talking about college athletics and so forth, and he's talking about the idea of a university. He wrote about sport, and I'll just read one little piece here. There is then a great variety of intellectual exercises which are not technically called liberal, meaning free, as in the liberal arts. On the other hand, I say there are exercises of the body which do receive that appellation. Such, for instance, was the palestra in ancient times, such as the Olympic Games, in which strength and dexterity of body, as well as of mind, gained the prize. In Xenophon, we read the young Persian nobility being taught to ride on horseback and to speak the truth, both being among the accomplishments of a gentleman. He also wrote, whenever personal gain is the motive, still more distinctive an effect has it upon the character of a given pursuit. Thus racing, which was a liberal exercise in Greece, forfeits its ranks in times like these, so far as it is made the occasion of gambling. So again, he's saying once this is no longer play just for its own purpose and now has an end different than that, you lose something. It damages it in some way. Shortly after Cardinal Newman's death, the Olympic Games were resurrected. They were brought back. I'm just going to use the Olympics for a moment here as a touchstone to talk about sport and to look at it, how it developed a little bit over time. In 1896, the Olympic Games, the first modern Olympiad, was contested in Olympia, Greece. Uh, honor and religion were still very much part an important part of the inspiration of the Games. Baron Pierre de Coubertin adopted the Olympic motto, Sidious Alpheus Fortius, swifter, higher, stronger, from his friend, this, little, this one of those little facts you know you can have, from his friend Father Henry Didon, a Catholic priest and headmaster of a French high school named St. Albert the Great. The phrase was actually written over the arch of the high school. Um, Baron Pierre de Coubertin also continued with the tradition of Pindar. And I don't know if any of you have ever read Pindar, but you have Pindar's odes. And basically, in the games, going back to Greek times, there would be a poet who would write an ode or a poem about the victor and so forth. Uh, and in some ways, he tried to carry that forward a little bit by asking Costas Palamas to write the hymn for the Olympic Games. And this hymn is actually today the official hymn of the Olympic Games. And although I'm not a Greek scholar, and I guess there's a wide range of interpretations or translations uh, available, because I've read some and thinking these don't seem to match. Um, but I thought I would just read this to you to give you an idea of how much religion and virtue were still very much part of the ideal and the thought as the Olympic Games were resurrected. It goes like this. O oh, ancient immortal spirit, pure father of the true, the beautiful and the good, descend, appear, shed over us thy light within the glory of your own earth and sky, which has first witnessed thy imperishable flame. Crown with the unfading branch, victors in the race and in strife. Create in our breast hearts of steel. In thy light, plains, mountains and seas shine and rosette you, and form a vast temple to which all nations throng to adore thee, O ancient immortal spirit. Pretty clear he was thinking about something beyond man, beyond himself. But over time, the Olympics really became less and less focused on religion, and in some ways even maybe virtue uh, in terms of the expectation, uh, and has really become more political and economical. You look at the Berlin 1936 Olympics, you have Adolf Hitler and the Nazi Party and that whole movement. Mexico City 1968, you have the civil rights, the black power and so forth that went on. Munich 1972, the Israelis are murdered uh, at that games. Moscow 1980, the U.S. boycotted that Olympics. And in L.A. 84, the Soviets boycotted that one. And so really that brings us up to contemporary time. So you can see all through history, all through time, play has been written about it has been lived, it has been part of our culture, it has been part of the human existence, the human experience. But I thought I would just now, and bring this up to modern time, just kind of shape this a little bit for you. And if we look at the world, first from an economic standpoint, and this, this, these numbers sometimes are staggering to me, Real Madrid, which is a, a soccer team in Europe, uh, annually generates about $600 million in revenue. The revenues for the top 20 soccer clubs are almost $6 billion a year. The 2010 FIFA World Cup event, soccer event, uh, the, the one event by itself, raised uh, revenues of 1.5 billion, and there was another 3 billion actually wagered on it. Globally, hundreds of billions of dollars are generated through all sport, in all different ways. Sometimes we, we don't think of all the connections in sport. So for example, you've got products, services, food, entertainment, legal, medical, internet, TV, cable, satellite, radio, print media, advertising, advertising alone, $124 billion last year. Uh, gambling, $144 billion. 
last year. Beijing Olympics, $3 billion in revenue. That's a lot of Bs. You know, we get so used to billions, it's like billions, there's nothing to a billion. Do you know how long it takes to count to a billion? No, I'm serious. Think about this for a second. If I said to you right now, I want you to start counting to a billion, and, you know, yes, you can say number one, two, and three, and four all within one second or faster, but when you get to those really big numbers, you're not going to be able to say them in a second. So I'm going to give you an average of three seconds per number. If you started now, did not stop to eat, go to the bathroom, or sleep, and you did it 24 hours a day, it would take you 95 years to count to a billion. If I had only working you half time, only 12 hours a day, it would take you 190 years to count to a billion. It's a big number. So when we're talking about sport and its influence in the world and on society, it's huge. Politics. We have increased nationalism. It's always been nationalistic. And again, don't, what I'm getting at today is not to say sport at one time in the past was pure and beautiful and perfect. It's always had corruption. It's always had problems. But I think it's being amplified today, and I'm going to address that in, in a few moments. But marketing, you know, political philosophies is certainly part of now athletics. You know, you look at the Beijing Olympic Games in 2008. I don't know what you thought about those opening ceremonies, but there was something dehumanizing about them. There was something about, I don't know, the loss of the individual soul that I was feeling as I watched those. Uh, in addition to that, the one thing that was really horrible that was done is that they had this pretty girl, little girl, out there singing the song. And really, it was the voice of another little girl who they thought was too homely to put on the TV. She's the one with the gift. She's the one with the beautiful voice. But again, it's the manipulation. And, and I, I'm not picking any one person out. I'm not picking out Beijing. I could go through many, many examples, but I'm just giving you some that we know about. Um, politicians, their affiliations with pro and national teams, we, we see that all the time. Culture. High five. Everybody know high five? You know, fist pump. You know, everybody does the fist thing, you know, now. Um, jewelry. Fashion. Using my microphone here. Um, where am I? Language. And basically what I, I, I'm seeing in culture is that not only does sport reflect society, but it actually has something to do with refining it. In the United States, very briefly, you know, if I look at the general economic, political, and cultural just take the 2010 NFL Super Bowl. The ads just for that one event were $260 million. Uh, presidents of 10 games. They invite the champions to the White House for the photo ops. Um, business terms. Think of these terms that we just take for granted now. We'll say, it takes a team. I'll have to take a rain check. It was a slam dunk. I struck out. Threw me a curve. Time out. Who's calling the shots? Okay, rookie. Can you pinch hit for me? He's a veteran. Who's the QB? I, I mean, these are terms now that we sort of accept in our normal culture as if they're, we don't know even, you know, we don't think sometimes of where they came from. 